Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Bless you, Bryn. Great to be here in Provo in Utah with you all. I come in from Colorado. I live in a little town called Ridgeway, and uh, population about 1,000. There's more cows there than people. Um, we have one stoplight and four pot shots, pot, pot shops. So, um, <laughs> I'm pot shops. I'm going back tomorrow, and then I'll be coming back to Utah in a week, so let me know if you need anything. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not saying Darren's a customer, but he is a very happy person. <laughs> if I still have a job after this. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, like, like Darren said, uh, we want to focus in a little bit on this, this hub or this service that RevRoad provides. Uh, finance is one of 12. And so we'll just talk a little bit on how, how this stage fits with, with various stages of a startup in particular. And uh, we have kind of a, we adopt a broad view of, of what a startup means. It goes all the way from idea stage. Amazon and Google still consider themselves startups. And uh, it's, a, I think, a very healthy um, perspective. Amazon has this concept they call day one. It's day one every day at, at Amazon. So I uh, love that perspective. We, we love entrepreneurs. We're going to uh, try to bring out some of these, these highlights, these, these lessons and applications in finance by telling the tale of two entrepreneurs with apologies to Charles Dixon, Dickens, who wrote uh, Tale of Two Cities. He started that out by saying, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? In this environment, in this location, in this day and age, with all the resources, all the technology, I think we can just say it was the best of times to do a startup, and especially if you're partnered with RevRoad. Jason? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's going to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you, Jason. So just to make sure we're all on the same page to start out with, and what brings us all here together is this concept, this word entrepreneur. And uh, what's, a, what's a simile that comes to mind immediately when you hear that word, that concept, entrepreneur? Crazy. <laughs> Any others? Dreamer. Dreamer, yeah. Number one answer is uh, that simile. We, we love these, these dreamers, these, these people that imagine how things can be. Is this another one? Risk taker? I think so. The word actually comes from the old French, entrepreneur, um, meaning literally to do or to undertake, as in to undertake the risk and management of a business. But even more literally, it's actually a simile for the word mortician in, in Old French, which, which is appropriate, right? Because how many startups actually survive? Not that many. It's uh, uh, according to the, whichever study you're looking at, uh, as, as much as 90, even 95% mortality rate. So. Somebody needs to bury the bodies, and I guess that's, that's where the word came from. But uh, we, we have in our, in our culture, in, in this country, unlike some other countries and some other cultures, a tolerance for failure. And that's important um, because we're not going to succeed every time. You have to eventually succeed, but uh, e even our, our country's national pastime, baseball, has a, a, a wide acceptance of failure. Do you know what you call a Major League Baseball player who fails 75% of the time? Rich, a millionaire is the word I was looking for. What about if they just move that needle a little bit back to 70% failure rate? What do you call that baseball player? Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer exactly. Yeah, so it's even, it's even in our, our, our national psyche, our, our, uh, our, our pastime itself kind of gives us some clues and some important direction that it's okay to fail. And at, at RevRoad, we're, we're, we're trying to move that needle just a little bit from like 90 or 95% to a little bit less. And that's, that's what we're passionate about and we're in business to help entrepreneurs. 
Now, I know here in, in Utah, there's this great Broadway production that's come here called Hamilton. And if anybody has tickets, I am available. We can, we can work out some kind of a deal with something I could bring back from Colorado or... <laughs> I'm sure I'm not gonna have a job by this afternoon. <laughs> but um, before Hamilton, there was this other great Broadway production that uh, ran for a lot of years in New York and then toured the country, and uh, that was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I think it has a lot of lessons of, uh, of entrepreneurship that, that apply. And one of the lines here that the narrator sings is, we all dream a lot, some are lucky, some are not. And so ju just the, it, it begs a question, is, is that what it boils down to? That whether it's business or baseball or something else in life, it's luck? Um, sometimes, maybe, but not often. We know there's, there's more to it. And so we, we create systems and services and we try to think through and be a little more intelligent than just relying on luck. Let's look at a short clip here from the actual, uh, this isn't the, the production, this is the, the movie version. Listen to the words the narrator sings here. Some folks dream of the wonders they'll do before their time on this planet is through. Some just don't have anything planned. They hide their hopes and their heads in the sand. Now I don't say who is wrong, who is right. But if by chance you are here for the night, then all I need is an hour or two to tell the tale of a dreamer like you. We all dream a lot, some are lucky, some are not. But if you think it, want it, dream it, then it's real. You are what you feel. But all that I say can be told another way. In the story of a boy whose dream came true And it could be you Okay, so a fun little production there so she sings these words, if you think it, want it, dream it, then it's real. You are what you feel. Does that apply to entrepreneurship? Maybe to start, right? It has to start somewhere. You have to have an idea, a, a, a dream. Um, you, you want it. You, you, you feel it. But are you really, if, if you, uh, uh, just because you feel it, does that mean it's, it's real? Probably not. So... Let's get to our tale of two entrepreneurs. Meet George and meet Betty. They work for a company called Rockets Incorporated, and they're both very bright um, rocket engineers, and they love their job. They, they like their company. Um, they sometimes don't always like their boss. He kind of stifles creativity. They have ideas they're bringing forward, and they've thought sometimes, well, man, I ought to take this and do this myself, but they've been there for a number of years at Rockets Incorporated, and it's a safe environment, and uh, they've, they've just never really had that, uh, that uh, driving passion to leave a perfectly good airplane and jump out and see if they could fly on their own. But one day, George's and Betty's boss comes to them and says, George, we've sold our company. There's another rocket company in California. We're moving to California. We want you to come with us. Will you come with us? Uh, I'm, I'm allergic to sunshine and happiness. <laughs> okay, so no to California? No, I, I don't think so. Okay, where's Betty? Betty, we value you. You're a great employee. We want you to come to California with us. Will you come? 
Okay, well, we are offering a 12-month severance package, full salary and benefits. Is that what you guys want to do? Okay, so George and Betty part ways with their big company, and it's day one in their entrepreneurship journey. So they're in their apartments, and they immediately go to work. George is doing what a lot of entrepreneurs do. He's got a great idea, and it's such a good idea that it's top secret. So he's partitioning himself off. He's in stealth mode, and he is going to be working away on his idea. Uh, Betty, on the other hand, isn't so sure that her idea is, is really solving a problem in the marketplace. So unlike George, who sequesters himself in his apartment, Betty is out there. She's... Uh, having a lunch appointment, she's talking with people, and she's, she's getting some market feedback. They both do this uh, very simple initial financial calculation that a lot of entrepreneurs have to do concerning their, their burn rate, their runway, how much time do they have? And so they work through this calculation and they decide if they can save a little bit, reduce that burn rate, they can extend that runway and keep working on their, their idea just a little bit longer. So that's a, an important concept um, that comes directly from finance uh, for an entrepreneur. So simple, and Betty's doing it on the back of an envelope. So a few months go by, and George is still in his apartment working away. He's, he's got this great idea, and nobody must see what this idea is until he's ready to spring it on the marketplace because he's a hard worker and he's smart and he knows his solution will work. Betty, on the other hand, is back out there talking with people. These are prospective customers, people in the industry, people that can give her feedback on her idea. And she comes upon this uh, fairly early on in her 12-month sabbatical, if you will, with her 12 months of runway, she comes upon this uh, lean canvas idea. And uh, she's iterating away, and she's uh, working hard. She comes up with some other very simple financial calculations. She has to figure out what's, what's the pricing model. Will somebody pay for this? And so she's out there talking to people and getting feedback and creating these, these very simple back-of-the-envelope types of calculations. Um, she gets a little more sophisticated a few months into it while George is still working away on his plan, and now she's got a revenue model, and she's trying to validate that revenue model. She's, she's got 10 sales calls per week on average, and she's getting a demo with three of those, and then following up and closing with one. And so she adds some cost to her model based on customer interaction and feedback, and uh, what's the competition charging, and what will the market bear? And George is still over here in stealth mode. So George is starting to get a little bit worried. Um, a friend tells him, you're, you're going to need to raise capital to keep that runway going. And otherwise, you're out of money, you're out of cash, you're going to have to go to California and work for Acme. So he starts cranking away on a business plan, big long document, has the, meets the, the thud test. There's substance to it, obviously. He's uh, becoming expert at spreadsheets and financial analysis. He's very adept at creating five-year plans, looking out into the future because he knows the market is going to love his idea. Meanwhile, Katie, is out there, she's come upon this MVP, minimal viable product idea with, uh, with what she's doing. She's iterated, instead of a new rocket component, she's finding out from the market that she needs to pivot a little bit. The market wants something lighter, more nimble. So she's working through various iterations and she's in this build, measure, learn loop. Whereas George is stuck on just the, the build, um, circle here. He's, he's boxed into this circle. So some more times, time goes by. Now George is really getting worried. And Betty is flying her, her next great prototype, her, her MVP out there, continues to get market feedback, and continues to iterate on her lean canvas, which includes very simple revenue plan, cost analysis. And she's 
she's building the beginnings, the foundations of a, a P&L model, working in some balance sheet items there with her cash analysis, and she's attracting a team. People are coming to work for her, and pretty soon she has an offer for funding, and she does another very simple financial calculation that uh, analyzes uh, how far along she is, and uh, that includes hiring a few people. She's getting office space now, and so she adds office or, or rent, and she's got a team of people and some other uh, SGNA types of expenses. And so she's, uh, she's working with a team that, uh, that is funded, and she does another calculation to see how, how long she can go. And she's got another 10 months added on to her runway while George is out of time. Um, it's, it's the end of the 12 months, and uh, he doesn't have much to show for it other than a, a pretty hefty business plan and he's, he's become really good at spreadsheets now and creating these five-year pro formas while Betty has been working away on what, what started with back-of-the-envelope calculations and has made a, a lot more progress. She's gotten funding and George has not. So uh, at the end of the 12 months, George is out of money. He's frustrated. Nobody will join him. They can't see his vision and so he goes to Betty and asks for a job because she needs a good accountant to, to work for his company. So, George, go get your job with Betty. He goes. <laughs> he goes from uh, rocket engineer to accountant, which I would call a promotion, but George doesn't feel like that. So, but at least he has a job. So, that's our that's our little little story and let's see if we can glean some some practical lessons from that so at, e at each stage and we'll go through five stages of a startup just at the idea stage don't worry that you're you don't have an MBA don't worry that you're not partnered with an accounting firm or have a CPA on staff you don't need that yet it's it's too early as you get further along with problem solution fit you can you can uh, graduate into spreadsheets and even QuickBooks that, where you start tracking some of your costs. And, and then at some point it is appropriate to, like Betty did, hire George to uh, come and take over that function because you as an entrepreneur want to stay focused on your um, solving this problem in the marketplace. And then as you continue to make progress, you will ramp up with a full FP&A team, financial planning and analysis who can, who can help you and keep you on track and give you deep, deep managerial, actionable um, kinds of information from running your books, from setting up your accounting system, from forecasting what, what is possible, and then you, you, get, you get bigger as you go. So Seth is going to uh, uh, talk more about these, these stages, stage planning for uh, the finance function in a startup. Hey, my name is Seth Robinson. Uh, they're having me talk about this because this is mostly what I do here. So in starting a company and in getting going, um, getting really granular and deep down into everything uh, that you have going on financially is not necessary. It's, it's pretty premature. So in, in the very beginning, the thing that you really need to nail, really need to figure out is your market, okay? There are foundational things you need to put in place as far as finance goes, but for the most part, you're gonna be looking at getting traction in your market. So at RevRoad, this is basically what we do when we get people start up, right? We get them set on QuickBooks, we can help you, anything like that, make sure your accounts are uh, linked there, one of the most important things is to be able to collect all the data you're creating because that becomes very, very important later on, especially from these early stages. Um, making sure that you have uh, you know, reports that you need, um, that you're able to call on the information that is important at that time, which again is, is a little information, but it's, it, it's very important. Um, these things aren't difficult to do. These things are pretty self-explanatory but making sure that they're done right and precise is extraordinarily important. So 
as you move on in stage two, this is where you're really kind of going out and discovering the problem that's in the market and testing to see if the solution that you're coming to is gonna be a viable one. Okay, so uh, you, you, you begin, once you understand what the market looks like, that's when you wanna start optimizing your financial systems. Make sure the ways that you're recording expenses, make sure the ways that you're recording um, accounts or different things matches what's going on in the market. So you can see whatever the market fluctuations are that are going on, how they're impacting you, or seeing how different impact of, of customer volumes or different marketing attempts, different, uh, uh, different attempts at uh, get, getting new clients or uh, new customers is working. Um, and again, this is, with, because of the foundation we've already stuck in here, putting this on top, just a little bit more work. A lot of these problems are typically ones people can kind of figure out on their own. Um, but the, the biggest thing is this is when things start getting chaotic, especially into the next phase. And so this is why we have these things in place at this time so that when they get chaotic, you don't have to quite, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more calming to know that all these things are done. And, um, Oh, on the, the last one, one I forgot. We also make sure that you can be set up with payroll, set up with tax holdings, make sure that you are in compliance with whatever um, incorporation you've gone into, with uh, C Corp, LLC, anything like that. Make sure that all of those are taken care of because that, that can be really, really bad. But because those are taken care of, hiring becomes really easy, so expanding, so ex uh, expanding and uh, growing your, your product and developing that becomes a lot easier as you can bring a team in around you. Um, and it's at this point where you actually want to start matching your product a lot and seeing what your product's impact is. And the way you measure that is through your financial data, right? That's how we're going to look at your success. And because we've set everything in place, putting these analytics over the top of it just makes sense. It's the next step, and it, it's, it's uh, harder than the previous two steps, definitely. But it allows... Um, allows a more comprehensive understanding of exactly the impact of the market is on your product and on your team and, and vice versa. Now the thing that's most important about this stage is here is where VCs and private equity firms and different, uh, and different capital raises need to go. The next phase when we're scaling it, right, uh, that phase, all these things need to be in place already and you need to be able to know what your company is worth and need to know what scaling look like and what, um, what your costs will be at any given, um, you know, uh, any given volume level or at any given time. Have those projections uh, set out there so that when people come to talk with you about your business, you, the entrepreneur who is going absolutely nuts and pulling your hair out because that's what entrepreneurs do. I think it's what it means in French or something. But, they're, but that's where your focus is gonna be. And so being able to have this in your back pocket at any time is what's really necessary because that's what shows venture capital firms and that's what shows or any, any other funding source or any other, um, you know, even if it's uh, debt financing, this is what they need to know and you being able to have that is what's going to impress them and also is going to be required in order to get any, you know, further help here. At this, at this time, basically, a lot of the stuff that you're going to be doing, you would want a small team or, or specialists of some sort to be doing these things. To evaluate your company, once you have cash flow, you start looking at your discount cash flow valuation. That's when you can start actually saying, based on our current operations, this is what our company is worth. And that is a very important number, especially when people start coming in and making offers on your company. Because they'll try to lowball you, because that's, they want your company for cheap, as cheap as they can. And we're able to, um, you know, with these things and these tools, we're able to basically uh, kind of right size the valuation. Make sure that um, you're getting a fair, a fair return. That sh what the the transaction that takes place makes sense to you, and is something that that you're comfortable with. Um, Bart's going to tell us about specifically how we do this and a lot of the kind of the more advanced stuff that that we kind of specialize in. Um, he's going to show you an example of a company that we have worked in in a situation where they're looking to be acquired. Okay. Thank you, Seth. So here's that example. Um, this, this is a company that uh, uh, we, we had as a portfolio company, um, still have them. Uh, they received an unsolicited offer 
uh, to be acquired by a private equity firm last year. And it was for several million dollars, and uh, it was exciting and uh, in, enticing and, and tempting to take. We, we did this uh, full-scale financial analysis on it, which, uh, again, comes a, a, a little bit later, not quite at idea stage, but once you show some traction and, and uh, start down that, that road of validation. Um, we were able to work through, and uh, Jason, just go ahead and skip over to, uh, to that next tab sheet to the forecast. Put in a, a, a financial forecast that included some other um, product offerings that this company was going to be going out into the market with. Pre-revenue on these new products, post-revenue on some, some older products, but uh, combine that into one financial system, and this is a bit of an eye test here. This part of the presentation is sponsored by your local optometrist. But uh, if, if you can just kind of uh, think through, Seth is a, a master with spreadsheets. Uh, some of us went last night to see our team member um, Rebecca perform in a symphony, and there was a, a conductor up there that harmonizes all of these violins and cellos and just makes the most beautiful music. Seth is your conductor with spreadsheets in syncing them and making them sing and harmonize all together. And so we take these, these systems at a, at a high level revenue model, build in a cost model, and scroll on down a little bit, Jason. Um, so we bring in balance sheet items to show assets and, and liabilities, and that all factors in. Part of that symphony gets down to a, uh, a cash analysis type of uh, uh, bottom line that fr from which all of these, uh, everything else is flowing into. And then, Jason, just skip over several uh, to the DCF. So Seth had, had mentioned this discounted cash flow model that uh, a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with. Um, and, and again, this isn't for idea stage, but this comes a little bit later in, in your uh, development of your, of your uh, identifying the, the problem and solving that problem that you've been uh, seeking traction and, and validation for in the marketplace. And so we, we worked with this company and took all of these interconnected spreadsheets and it fed into this DCF and we were able to convince them that uh, there's a lot more value that's uncaptured, that with a little bit more work, actually a lot, lot more work, but uh, some more time, some more baking, you can capture a lot more value here. And so that's hard for entrepreneurs to, to turn down that, that big money um, because it, w it was several million dollars. But uh, there's, there's more to it than money, but, uh, and, and it is a labor of love. Your, your startup becomes, um, I know with, with some of those startups I've done in the past, uh, kind of like your own children, and you don't want to just uh, sell them, but uh, I would sell some of my own children. I would probably let go for a, no, I'm just kidding, Tanner. But uh, with, with your startup, everything is for sale, right? But if you have a good enough solution, you're solving problems in the market, chances are in an economy like this with good M&A activity, something is going to come along. So how do you know that that's, that's fair value? So there, there are ways. And this is kind of a graphical depiction of this NPV model, what the what Seth's formulas are doing in taking top line down to bottom line, calculating EBITDA, earnings before income, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and forecasting that all out into the future, and then bringing those, the sum of those numbers back to the present time using some kind of a discount rate, which the discount rate reflects risk and uncertainty and time value of money. And so uh, this can, can definitely come to your startup but uh, again, we, we keep saying this, and it's, it's an important point. You don't start with this. This is, this is further down the road. So here are a few takeaways in summary. Uh, financial analysis is needed at all stages of your startup. Just like Betty demonstrated here with the back of the envelope, types of calculations she was doing on pricing, on a revenue model, later adding a cost model. Seth was getting a little ahead of himself, or George is uh, who the character was, and he was 
uh, launching right into a big business plan that had these five-year pro formas. It's been said, you know, I, I, I grew up on this stuff and I've written lots of business plans and have, have created lots of five-year pro forma financials, but the, the world has changed and you no longer need to do that. Uh, somebody said um, only Soviets and VCs want to see a five-year plan anymore. Soviets no longer exist and VCs don't even want to see that five-year plan. So take it one stage at a time. Um, it can be very straightforward, as Betty demonstrated here, and then add resources. Scale in finance as your startup scales up. And so that's, that's the main takeaway from uh, what we wanted to share with you today. That's, that's the big headline, that uh, finance can be as complicated as you want to make it, and it, it does get complicated, and you do need help, you do need professionals. But maybe not to start, maybe not at idea stage. And as you progress along those stages, there are trained professionals with good credentials, lots of good spreadsheet skills, systems that can be brought to bear and can help you as you, as you scale up. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. I realize I'm standing in between you and your lunch, but would love to entertain a couple of questions if there are any questions. Yes, sir. I'm Mike Alder from BYU. I'll never forget <clears throat> my first company, the day that the CFO came on board and stood up in front of the board of directors and presented the financials. It was like a thousand pound weight had been lifted off my back. Uh, and it was like a symphony was playing because his <laughs> skills uh, were so much better than mine in being able to orchestrate what needed to be said. But so wise in the counsel you've given. Uh, I remember trying to do the books myself, early stage, how challenging that was because I didn't have training in finance. Finding somebody who could help me was critical. And uh, uh, I'm really glad that we've had this focus. Yeah, thank you. So you were the entrepreneur and running a startup, but you didn't, you didn't start off by, by hiring a CPA or going and finding an no, MBA. No, I swept the floors at night. Okay, <laughs> doing it all, okay, very good, thank you. And, and, and that's, that there's, there's a, a common question that we hear kind of related to that, when do you bring on a CFO? When, when do you make those, those hires? So, you know, somewhat uh, self-serving, there, there is a role for a CFO. And we, we actually can add some value, um, different kind of value than a rocket engineer adds or than a, uh, a serial entrepreneur adds, but there are roles to play in a team environment. Again, as uh, Katie or Betty demonstrated, joining her team and getting lots of people to help with the lift. You had a question? Yeah, so my question would be, how, how would you go about valuing a company that is pre-revenue? Yeah, so great question, and uh, I, I have two answers for you. Um, the first one might sound a little glib, which is uh, don't. Don't value it. And, and by that I mean, so you, you, have to, you have to get to the right stage. But if, if, you, have, if, if you, happen to, you happen to be lucky enough to be able to get funding at a very early stage, and sometimes that, that may not be luck, that may not be the right thing to do, but let's say that you, you do, they have new securities now called uh, safes and kisses. Um, these, these are the two names. They're both basically the same thing, kind of a, a convertible note into equity, and they don't place a value on it. They, they postpone that uh, valuation until, the, until there is another funding round, uh, 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 an equity funding round. And so it's kind of, Kicking the can down the road, but it's, it's something that makes a lot of sense. Um, the other way is if, if you're not going to do that, and, and companies have been historically funded based on a couple of very bright engineers coming together and they have an idea and 
uh, a VC will fund them based on that alone. They will create a, a, a DCF, a discounted cash flow. The guesses they're making are, are, are so wild. This one that I, I walked through just briefly here that was the eye test, we're basing that on historical financials. So we have our, our P&L and our balance sheet and our cash flows that have taken place for a few years and then we're projecting into the future with that foundation if that makes sense. But a brand new startup, pre-revenue, you have to use a very high discount rate and know that you're making wild guesses going into it to get that valuation. But those, those new securities, safes and kisses, help alleviate that, that uncertainty problem. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you. <laughs>